According to the Bible, the stakes are indeed very high when it comes to one's eternal destination. For those who do not receive salvation through Christ Jesus, the destination is eternal condemnation. But for those who are saved, it is eternity with God in the new heavens and earth. So then, it would be expedient to know if one is in fact saved before departing this present state of being, because to simply identify as saved, as a Christian, is not enough. As Jesus famously taught in Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Paul writes later in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you are disqualified? But how do we test ourselves? Let's look at seven ways shown in the New Testament. Test question one, do I believe? Becoming a true Christian begins with believing the good news of the kingdom, the gospel of Jesus the Christ. In Jesus' conversation to Nicodemus, we get perhaps the most well-known verse about believing, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Notice the very important preposition, in. This believing is not just agreeing to some historical facts, but placing faith or trust in the risen living Jesus and what he accomplished. In Romans 10.9 we read, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Believing goes deeper than the mind. It must be at heart level. And the believing will be such that what comes out of the mouth witnessed by others is that you belong to Jesus. You believe he is the risen Lord and live submitted under his authority. Your ongoing conversations with others reflect this. This believing leads us to our second test question. Do I have a relationship with him? John 1.12 But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. True, deep down, heart level belief leads to receiving, receiving the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit. Romans 8.15 to 17 says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Paul makes the contrast between a slave and a son. Bondage versus adoption. A slave does not have the same close connection that a son enjoys. And what is interesting is that if one is truly saved, a genuine Christian, there should be a witness with our spirit that we are a child of God. The Holy Spirit gives us the confidence that we are accepted into the family of God and are in a living relationship with our Heavenly Father. As Jesus is God's Son, having Jesus in us by His Spirit, we too are accepted as sons. We are adopted, having received the spirit of adoption. Relationship is a chief purpose of our salvation, being reconciled back to God. And in John's first letter, we learn that our relationship goes as far as fellowship. Chapter 1, verse 3. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Fellowship in the original Greek, quinonian, from quinonia, means association, community, communion, joint participation. What is shared in common as the basis of fellowship, partnership. So, not just sons and daughters who are under the headship of God the Father, but close enough in relationship to be considered in communion with him, to participate actively with him in his kingdom. Test question three, do I have conviction of sin? Becoming a Christian obviously involves the initial acknowledgement of and repentance from sin. 
But part of a real and living ongoing relationship with God is knowing when the relationship is not healthy. This includes a strong sense of grief when we have fallen short, when we have sinned. If we sin, we should quickly recognize that something is wrong. And, as instructed in 1 John 1 9, confess our sins so God can forgive us and there be nothing in the way of continuing in right relationship. This is not a psychologically, religiously imposed guilt, but rather a heart conviction, a spiritually amplified conscience, a pang of grief felt inwardly as the spirit who dwells inside us grieves. Ephesians 4.30 reads, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. The conviction of sin stems from genuine repentance. Coming to faith in Christ involves turning from sinful ways and to follow the narrow path. As Paul writes in the verses leading up to Ephesians 4.30, verses 21 to 24. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God, in true righteousness and holiness. In 1 Corinthians, Paul shows how some can wear the badge of a Christian and yet still be deceived, listing a range of things that should only be associated with those who are not yet saved. Chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. One can have a moment of repentance, but there should be works that are evidence that the repentance was real. Paul, explaining to King Agrippa his obedience to Jesus, includes in his explanation of declaring the gospel that his hearers should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. This leads us to our next test question. Do I desire to do right? It stands to reason that by having the Spirit of God dwelling in us as a believer, we will not only have a general change in behaviour in terms of moving away from ongoing sin, but also moving towards actively doing good in cooperation with the goodness of God at work within. Consider the following, 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 to 6. Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk, just as he walked. Then, down to verses 15 through 29. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, it is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. And in chapter 3, verses 2 to 3. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. Test question 5. Do I have the fruit of the Spirit? In addition to a desire to follow Jesus' commands specifically, Cooperation with the Holy Spirit also brings about evidence of a change in character more generally. Like the fruit on a fruit tree demonstrates the health of the tree, so too are the fruits of certain character attributes evidence of genuine faith, the goodness of God's Spirit being outworked in a believer's life. Galatians 5, 22-23a 
but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. This provides us with a checklist to help us determine whether or not we truly received Jesus when we believed. That is, that our belief was not just mental assent, but true saving faith. This is not to suggest that true Christians never have moments where they are stressed, impatient, unkind, undisciplined, or harsh, etc., as this would be to ignore how the New Testament acknowledges Christians will continue to sin, as already mentioned, and that, depending on how long one has believed for, certain backgrounds for some believers, the leadership a Christian sits under, certain environments a Christian is unable to avoid, etc., seasons of fruitfulness may vary. Test question six. Do I sense God's leading, hear his voice? Obviously, in any healthy relationship, communication is key. Not monologue, but dialogue, both speaking and listening. The Bible shows quite clearly that the same applies to our prayer life with God. Not only do we speak our minds and ask God for the things we need and desire, but we are to listen and know his mind and heart on matters. As sons and servants of our Father and King, we are to hear and obey, to follow his direction. In John chapter 10 verses 1 to 4 and 14 to 16, Jesus says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. And concerning a sense of leading, Romans chapter 8 verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. We come to our final test. Do I have love for others? Galatians 6, 9-10 And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Concerning love for our brothers and sisters in Christ particularly, in John 13, 34-35, Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. 1 John chapter 2, verses 9-11 he who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. And in chapter 3, verses 14 to 15, going as far as to say, We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. John continues, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods, and sees his brother in need, and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before him. And in chapter 4, verses 20 and 21, If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. As to love for others more generally, James chapter 2 verse 8. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbour as yourself, you do well. 
and Romans 13, 8 to 10. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet, and if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbour, therefore love is the fulfilment of the law. This is not necessarily to ask whether or not you have feelings of love, but rather, act in like manner to God's actions of love, choosing to love, in cooperation with the spirit at work within us. Greek has a number of types of love. The one we refer to here in our context is agape, which means benevolence, goodwill, esteem. Love which centers in moral preference, to prefer, typically refers to divine love, i.e. what God prefers. So, do you pass the test? Or are there areas of concern? There can be no other test when honest answers are so critical. Perhaps you could consider the following. It is unlikely you would falter at one or more all the time while doing well at the others. Likewise, no one should be able to claim 100% certainty 24-7 because we still live in a fallen world waiting for the consummation of the kingdom. There will be times when we falter at one or more. The test is more of a general gauge to ask oneself, am I demonstrating these evidences of being saved most of the time? Do I have peace and confidence in my faith? If you are thinking right now that you would fall more in the unsure end of the spectrum for each of the seven tests a majority of the time, then we urge you to seek God for true salvation to also find a mature Bible-believing Christian to talk and pray with. If you answered mostly towards the certain end, then we encourage you to continue in your fruitfulness, encouraging others towards true saving faith in Christ Jesus.